FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's June 21st, 2017. Well, oil uh, is in trouble. The countries that produce it are in even bigger trouble. And the banks and hedge funds, etc., that finance it, well, who knows what's going to be with them. Perhaps they can extend and pretend to infinity. That remains to be seen. But whatever happened to the concept of drilling a hole in the ground, pulling out oil, and turning a profit, it seems to be out there with the, with the magical stock market. And here to discuss is Chris Martinson, peakprosperity.com. Any questions or comments, email a kl at kerrylutz.com. Chris, welcome back. Thanks, Kerry. It's good to be back. Hey, so you're, it's hard to believe the quality of this connection. And you're like, uh, how many thousands of miles are you from Florida? You must be three, 3,500, 5,000. I don't remember the exact distance to where you are. Oh, it's a it's a solid nine hour flight, so it's a good distance. Yeah, so it's forty five hundred miles. I've taken that flight, I know, but uh, hey, that's uh, the price of uh, seeing the world here. So, uh, speaking of the world and what's happening in Saudi Arabia, they just realigned the uh, kingdom's line of succession. It basically purged out, I guess, elements of the government they felt were um, antithetical to the existing uh, the existing king. Uh, what's going on here? Well, that's certainly Game of Thrones material. Saudi Arabia, I mean, it's just first. Let's just be completely honest. You know, the United States considers Saudi Arabia one of our closest allies when you measure Saudi Arabia on virtually every dimension that we should care about, uh, whether it's democracy, uh, rights of individuals, women's rights, uh, criminal uh, rights and proceedings, uh, the right to protest, uh, the right to vote, you name it. I mean, it's just it is just an absolutely uh, backwards uh, nation from from so many human development standards. And yet they seem to be our, our best friend. And of course, we all know the reason why. They uh, sell a lot of oil and agreed a long time ago to recycle their oil profits in dollars and keep those housed in the United States. In return, they get our protection. So um, uh, it's just fun watching uh, the media and administrations through sins of omission and commission try and pretend like having Saudi Arabia as an ally makes sense. Uh, they don't. They're troublemakers in the region. Uh, they fund a lot of terrorism or what we call terrorism or what we we think we're, we stand against. Uh, and uh, and so I just, to, for the life of me, I can't understand why we continue that particular relationship with them. But things are beginning to heat up. Uh, long simmering feuds have finally broken open. Uh, we actually saw uh, the claim that uh, Saudi Arabia had intercepted a boat, one of three, that it managed to capture from Iran, loaded with explosives to, coming over to do who knows what, but caught near a, a major oil installation. So um, so these things are all really beginning to unfold rapidly. And, and when they do, to see a purge come along where uh, the existing uh, King, I guess we have to call him now, Solomon would uh, take that opportunity to <laughs> begin to reshuffle that deck of 3,000 princes. <clears throat> uh, that This seems like uh, just something that, that makes sense in a turbulent era and area at this time. Yeah, it is turbulent. It's always been turbulent and a lot of palace intrigue there, but their economy is going down the tubes, isn't it? Well, it is. They need uh, very high oil prices, much higher than currently, to sustain their existing spend levels. They, they've been running a um, basically a, a bread and circus for a long time. I, I don't know how much circus they got going on, but certainly they've been paying uh, and supporting social programs because they got a lot of poor people. There's not a lot of opportunity in the country uh, for a lot of the people. They've got a very, very steeply pyramid-shaped uh, population curve over there, a lot of young people. So we're talking the troublesome ages, you know, men under the the age of 25, got a lot of them. Uh, and, uh, and so they've been using oil revenues to help keep things sort of uh, propped along, subsidizing everything from food to fuel, you name it. Uh, but now they're hemorrhaging. Uh, they are, they need probably last estimate I saw was oil north of 110 a barrel to begin to balance the books. Oh, and of course they're very far from that. So they're bleeding, uh, uh, pretty heavily at this time doing bond issuances, talking about an IPO for Saudi Aramco, Yanni, you know, all these ways of, of getting uh, more funding to come in during a really troublesome time. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, you know, the odds of, uh, what are the odds of oil going back over a hundred a barrel anytime soon? 
no chance anytime soon, you know, unless there was something that did shut down the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, but then, of course, I don't think Saudi Arabia would be selling too much. Um, so uh, that wouldn't help them much. Uh, but right now, the world is heavily oversupplied with oil. We've got a number of new um, old players coming back online, Libya, Nigeria. Of course, the shale patch in the United States continues to just uh, be working against its own best interests and, and can't manage to not uh, drill more and produce more uh, it, it for any reason whatsoever, mostly just because that's what they do. And they need to keep that whole thing going uh, as, as uh, fast and as long as they can. But let me be clear. Uh, every company I look at in the shale patch, uh, forget all anything you're hearing about. We're, we're breaking even at 40. You can, this is easy. You go out and get the financial statements of these companies and you look at their cash flows uh, and you discover that they're negative free cash flowing and have been their entire existence. So if they couldn't make money when oil was 100 a barrel and they're not doing it when it's 40 and they're hemorrhaging all the way long and they need constant new infusions of debt and equity capital financing in order to keep things going, reasonable people should be asking, uh, where, where, what's going on here? Yeah, where's the money coming from here? Uh, it's all just borrowing, keeping them afloat? Yeah, it's, it's astonishing. You know, you look at the companies, um, some of the big ones out there, uh, the biggest of the shale operators, and, you know, they're, they're huge companies. They're, uh, the debt position of most of these has uh, doubled or tripled since the 2014 peak. They've got lots of debt on the books. And, of course, they're <laughs> finding willing takers for this debt uh, all over the place. Uh, people snapping it up at just what I consider to be obscene rates. Uh, you know, very, very low rates of interest for something that's clearly junk debt and should be compensated as such. And still it's getting snapped up. So what did they do, Chris? Did they just roll over the old defaulted debt or the debt that they couldn't service and get new debt? And you had a few bankruptcies, a few big ones, but for the most part, not a lot of bankruptcies in the oil patch, which you would expect. Well, I think there's been a little over 100 so far, um, many of them smaller companies, so they didn't really hit the hit the waves, but there have been uh, quite a few. And the companies have also uh, 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 avoided some of the optics of this by, instead of having a full-on default, having a smaller company that's, that's belly up being taken over by a larger one um, and having the debt assumed uh, onto their balance sheet. So we've seen a bunch of that happening. Um, but but let's be really clear, the, the cash flows of this entire industry are upside down down have been for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. That we know. And it's always the paydays coming uh, in the future. It reminds me of the airlines in the seventies, uh, you know, Oh, we'll, we'll be profitable eventually after they've consolidated and there's only four airlines left and they can charge whatever they want. Yeah. They're profitable, but in the oil patch, you just don't have that type of market dynamic. No, you don't. And um, and the world is really very heavily oversupplied with oil at the moment. There's a lot of floating storage out there. I, last I heard, 119 million barrels yeah. just parked in, in various uh, large container ships, basically idling. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have to understand is that, you know, one of the largest drivers of demand growth for new oil has been China. And China's really uh, got all the indications of rolling over pretty hard at this point in time. Uh, I, I would not be surprised to see China China uh, slip into a pretty, pretty interesting recession um, uh, this year. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a real possibility. Uh, so electric cars are 20 years out. I do believe self-driving cars really are innovation. Electric cars at this point, I'm just, I love them. I mean, they're really fun to drive. They're fast as hell. But, you know, I just don't see them as, uh, you know, two cars in every two EVs in every garage and a, a chicken in every pot. You know, I don't see it. Well, I think what's easy to, to dismiss is the idea that we just continue this story by other means. And the other means in this story is just everything that looks like an internal combustion engine, just mentally flip it out and have it become an electric car. And that's what we'll do instead. It doesn't really make sense. And so for the people who care about uh, the ecological impacts, you know, saying, well, electric cars, they're emissions free. No, they're not. Two things. First, uh, when you make it, you have to build it using energy, right? And the mm -hmm. just the battery pack alone, I've I've heard um, uh, for you know, one of these hundred kilowatt battery packs for for one of the new Tesla S three is one of the, a big battery pack takes a, uh, uh, releases about eight years worth 
of carbon dioxide that a normal car would would uh, emit driving. <laughs> so so your first eight years of carbon emissions are locked in the car before you've even like driven it a foot when, it, when you get it, right? Yeah. Part two is, well, you still have to recharge this thing. Please just work with me for a second. Think about where does that electricity come from? Go, well, it my comes electricity from comes from wind towers. Please look at a video of how wind towers are installed. See if you can notice how much diesel fuel is involved, not just yeah. in the manufacturer, but the installation, all of that. There's uh, This is what people wind. don't understand is that is that fossil fuels are subsidizing or hidden in every single thing we're calling alternative energy. And it's yeah. not hard to unravel that. Hey, I thought the electricity came from the plug in the wall when I plug it in. You mean I have to send it from someplace? <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. I just learned I this last year. Apparently they do. <laughs> God, I can't, I can't believe it. Well, but uh, the one thing I do see, uh, now Tesla has a lot of faults and it's a totally speculative bomb waiting to blow up and maybe it will and maybe it won't. The odds are good that it will because it's not like the auto business is non-competitive. They've got competitors that, from places they haven't even heard of yet. But uh, what Tesla has done, they've done several noteworthy things. Number one, they've gotten rid of model year rollouts. The model year of a Tesla is irrelevant. That's a good thing. Number two, they made the car, and we don't know if this is good or not, an upgradable item. So yeah, there are innovations in the hardware in the car for sure, uh, but they've made it uh, software upgradable. So every car comes off the Tesla line just about the same, except for the badge on the back. Maybe the battery size is a little different, whether you've got the second motor or not, but they pretty much come off the line equal. And then everything else is software. So that's a brilliant innovation. And number three is their self-driving aspects of the new S class and X is far and away better than anything else out there to the point Chris, where it's almost revolutionary. Uh, my friend Mike got one. He said, you know, I just programmed in the address and it just drove me there, literally. And, uh, you know, I kind of kept my hand on the wheel, but the car drove me there. So if the cars can be fetched. And, you know, most cars sit in the garage or the driveway or the parking lot 90% of the time unused, 95%. So that concept of uh, communal ownership or some kind of centralized ownership of vehicles and you pay as it takes you wherever, I think is coming. And I think it's coming in, you know, a reasonable amount of time, not not two to five years, probably, or maybe some limited, but 10 to 15 to 20. I think we're going to see that. Well, I certainly hope so. And and that's that's the part where the story, I think, if you don't take that step you just took, if you don't go there, if you think, oh, we just replace, you know, current internal combustion engines with electric cars and somehow that fixes something, it doesn't. But what you're talking about does. Now, this is an opportunity where we need a lot fewer vehicles in total because now you don't have to have one and I have to have one and everybody's got to have one. You might need what one vehicle for, I don't know what the figure would be, but 10. So you yeah. first off, we're, you know, you're going to kill the automobile industry. You know, it, it like needs a fraction of what it used to need. Um, second of all, the entire, uh, uh, industries of, of, of mechanics. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I went to a Tesla, uh, shop when I was out in California at the SpaceX facility and they had a, a, a yeah. garage there and, you know, they have like a, a big bay window. You can look through, like you're looking at your baby and at the mm -hmm. hospital. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and there's guys and or gals the in there wash. working on Tesla's and they're wearing white coats, yeah. right? Like, like doctors. And there's these little trays. There's no oil to be seen. There's no grime. There's no nothing. I mean, it was all very automated how they lifted the frame off the chassis. Um, you know, all that. So it was astonishing to, to watch. And there was very little maintenance that needed to be done at all. Yeah, right. It doesn't need brakes. The brakes, they say, will last for half a million because they're not really brakes, only at very slow speeds. Does the car actually have a friction based braking system? Otherwise, it, it reverses the motor and you stop like an airplane uh, lands on the uh, on the runway and then it flips the uh, the reverse thrusters on. It's not exactly it, but, you know, they reverse yep. the engines and it slows you down. And that's what the Tesla does. Yeah, there's seven moving parts in there, I think, besides like the windows. And no carburetors, no yeah. transmission, no transmission fluid, no oil, no, no oil dirt. change, no, uh, no coolant, uh, no radiator, yeah. no. I mean, it's just astonishing when they lift the thing off. You're like, that's it. It looks like a water, a silver yeah, water, it's melon. a water melon. engine. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So so there are big innovations in the car, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a boom for the auto industry. In fact, uh, you could see a dramatic contraction, although the replacement cycle 
you know, there's, I don't know, a billion or two billion cars out there on the road. So if you need a couple hundred million, uh, but maybe the car companies are going to own them, you know, the Uber concept, I don't know, but you can, you can summon the car now. If you're in a parking lot, just hit the button and it'll come get you, you know, it's uh, uh, pretty remarkable. And, and that'll use a lot less energy overall. It's, it's, it'll be a great idea. Um, but it, to think it's 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 going to be so disruptive uh, oh, yeah. for, I mean, I could pick 10 different sub-industries, cabbies, yeah. uh, you know, from limo mechanics drivers, to, you name it. Limo drivers, body shops, because if most of the accidents come from, from uh, human driver error and all of a sudden there's no human driver for the error to occur, uh, in theory, you'll see, you know, computerized crack ups, right? Some kids having some fun and hacking and uh, making a highway shut down for a couple hours. Uh, but you're not going to have like uh, in Florida here on I-95, I call it the highway of death. I mean, they're just like pulling bodies away all day long. And, uh, you know, it stretches for 400 miles. So it's a long stretch of road, but it's a, it's a very dangerous place that you really don't want to send your loved ones to. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I've heard that term before. I, I lived in Florida for two years of my life and I drove a motorcycle and I, oh my I God. came to, I, I came to picture. really fear for my life. I mean, you just, yeah, I couldn't trust any stop sign. Red lights were meaningless. Yeah. You name it. Like you just, no. <laughs> yeah. Rightfully so, man. I mean, yeah, you're so on the money. It's just totally, uh, it's just an accident waiting for a place to happen. Right. <laughs> it's you like know. one constant accident and you just notice yeah. it from time to time. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's a, and it's constant, constant nonstop. So self-driving cars, but, but there are infrastructures and cottage industries that feed off of all this stuff, all the misery, right? People feed off, you know, lawyers and, uh, you name it, uh, all of them are feeding off of it. So uh, it's going to be a great societal change, but it's not like it's going to happen overnight here. It just isn't. Some guy said within the, uh, you know, the five years, everybody will be self-driving. And I just don't, uh, don't see that one happening. No, it, it, there's a time scale cost. And, and of course, all of this, all of this, Carrie depends on us having a functioning economy because this will all be very right. expensive. While we're talking about improvements, we're talking mm -hmm. about capital cost improvements. Here's why your friend's wrong about the five-year thing. The reason that we wouldn't just, I mean, if we could just magically, if energy wasn't a component of this story and capital didn't matter, we'd <laughs> snap our fingers and we'd get yeah. there. But the problem is, is that for the guy who just this year bought a F-250 tricked out totally for $65,000 or whatever they're spending on those horrible yeah. things at this point, right? Um, you think in, in three years, because he can call up a car and maybe save a few bucks, he's going to like just trash his F-250? No, that thing will be in service for its design life uh, almost certainly. So even if today the only option was for new self-driving cars to be put on the road, everything else shuts down. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing. It would still take 10 years before half the fleet was replaced by that means because that's how long it takes for these things to wear down. And this is just a, a part of business. Once you've already spent the capital, you tend to want to wring out everything you right. can from that as long as it makes sense until it dies a natural death and is depreciated completely and gone. And then you go to the next thing. So this is what I think your friend is missing is that is the, the inertia in the embedded capital that's already in the system guarantees this is going to take time. Yeah, it's a process. It's like any other, it's not like getting uh, DVRs replacing, um, you know, DVD players or video cassette recorders. You know, this is far more profound than that. So, so we have all that to look forward to. And in the meantime, like you say, the economy has to figure out a way to survive leading up to all this. And then the disruption that's going to occur afterwards and those are not like pleasant prospects here, Chris. I don't think so. You know, my view is that the Federal Reserve really went off the reservation in 1994 over a very small bond market hiccup and created the roaring rest of the roaring 90s because Alan Greenspan uh, did something very dumb. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also with the long term capital management bailout in 1998, gave a very bad message to Wall Street, which they've ran with and not yeah. forgotten. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, the reaction to the 2000 stock bust uh, gave us something even worse. And then, of course, course, the reaction to that is now giving us what we're in right now, which I think is something even worse. And so when this uh, giant, horrible experiment with uh, inflating 
the largest set of bubbles the world has ever seen. Uh, when this finally bursts, it's going to take a long time to pick up the pieces. It just will. Yeah. Yeah. The world's going to be a different place after it bursts as well, isn't it? Right. Well, it is. And it's already shifting at this point in time. And, and you know, when you look at the number of countries that the United States now is at sort of geopolitical loggerheads with when you, uh, it's a, a growing list, the, the stuff with Russia is very concerning to me personally at this point. Um, and I don't think that's that's I can't I Trump isn't helping. He, he sort of continued whatever neocon policy was already in place beforehand. Um, but whoever it is that's decided in Washington that we have to make Russia an enemy is doing a great job. They got some really nice lapdogs in the media. Yeah, um, they're, they're doing a bang up job at it. But uh, I think it's a terrible idea and Absolutely. not the, exactly the wrong enemy to be picking at this point in our history. Actually, we should be much more closer allied with uh, Russia. We have a lot more long term common interests, as as do they. It, you know, there's a lot more to be uh, allied with them than to be this nonsense. And it's McCain, you know, McCain, whoever he's working for, you know, is one of the prime drivers of this thing for sure. You know, yeah. And definitely. he's just like, can we just admit it? He is just a, a war. He's insane war hawk. I don't, oh, you know, yeah. and if you track back his history, by the way, people say, oh, the war hero, he was, you know, he was captured and held in a, in a, in a camp. When you track back what he actually did when he was there, mm, he's not, he's never been what you might call a, <sighs> a stand up kind of guy. He's yeah. always been a self-interested, uh, uh, really horrible human being as far as I can tell. Yeah. Awful guy. You're correct. You know, and it, not so stable either. But anyway, we're drifting. So so don't go out and buy that Tesla quite yet uh, unless you've got so much money that it doesn't matter and you don't care what's happening uh, to the world and the markets out there. Uh, your trusty internal combustion engine powered car is going to be with us for a long time to come. So just figure out how to make that thing work for you in as efficient a manner as possible, right? Well, absolutely. And uh, don't get me wrong. I, I've, I've driven Teslas. They're amazing. Yeah. Um, truly, truly uh, the direction we should be going in. Uh, yeah. in. No question about that. And a lot of issues to work through still and, and lots of things we have to think through, not least of which is where and how are we going to be supplying our energy going forward? We still don't have a, what I consider to be a decent strategy in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really going to bite us at some point. Agreed for sure. And uh, just be ready for it. That's the main thing that you need to do. Anyway, Chris, so uh, where's the best place to find you? At peakprosperity.com, of course, come on by. We have a uh, lot of free information. We've got a subscription newsletter and a good community of people. And we're talking about these sorts of issues all the time. And these are the uh, existential issues coming up for the next uh, decade and the next generation. Anyway, uh, you'll find a link to Chris's site in the show notes to our interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. While you're there, sign up for the newsletter. Again, emails kl at kerrylutz.com, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Chris, we'll talk to you again real soon. All right. Thank you, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.